Um, my name is Lori Gerson. I'm an educational coordinator at Yad Vashem, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to the second session in Yad Vashem's master class series. So uh, I assume most of you were here last week, so welcome back. If anybody's new, we're happy to have you. Um, it is an honor for me today to introduce to you Ephraim K., who I personally have had the pleasure of calling him boss for the past couple of years. Sadly for us, after a 32-year career at Yad Vashem, Ephraim will soon be retiring. Um, having come to Yad Vashem with a BA and an MA in modern Jewish history and the history of the Holocaust from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Ephraim joined Yad Vashem's educational staff after teaching in the Israeli high school system for many years. Since 1994, Ephraim has been the director of the international seminars at the International School for Holocaust Studies of Yad Vashem. And in 2015, he became the director for the Jewish World and International Seminar. During this time, he has coordinated and led over 450 international seminars from over 20 countries in eight different languages. He has led and guided more than 17 trips to Poland for high school students, graduates of the Yad Vashem Seminar, and IDF officers. In, um, he has organized 10 international conferences on Holocaust education. And of course, I have to mention that he has been directing the Gandal Seminar for Educators from, from Australia, which is one of Yad Vashem's flagship programs and is described by participants as a life-changing experience for them. So it really is my pleasure and we won't wait any longer. Ephraim, um, please, we're happy to have you. Thank you, Lori, and it's nice to see everybody. I'm going to put up my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. Uh, and before I begin. All day long, if I were a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to wear a Chicks and turkeys and geese and ducks for the town to see and hear. Squawking just as noisily as they can. And each of the Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, have your attention. Uh, that was just the music, it was not a video. Uh, to get us into the atmosphere, we're going to go back to the beginning of the 20th century and talk about the Polish Jewry. That was Tevia, a wonderful Tevia and filled on the roof. If I were a rich man, eh, that'd be nice. And to try and give you a flavor of who were these Polish Jews and where they come from. I'm gonna show you also, I have bits and pieces of video, but I'm going to ask essentially, I'm gonna go back and forth between sharing the screen and also be able to see you, which is important. But I'm going to ask essentially three different questions here. The first one is, who are these Polish Jews? The second one, what were the major issues that they faced in interwar Poland? And the last one, which is a, I'll spend more time on that. What were the possible solutions? that different Jewish political parties proposed to solve these issues. And when we're talking about Polish Jews, there's no such thing as just a Polish Jew. Since Poland ceased to exist at the end of the 18th century, it was gobbled up by Germany in the West, 
by Soviet, uh, by the Tsarist Russia in the East, by the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the South. So there was no Poland up until uh, the end of World War I. So there were Jews that find themselves in this newly uh, created Polish state that formerly belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire or their part of Imperial Germany. And most of them were actually part of Tsarist Russia. I wanna show you a, a nice map that I have prepared here. Uh, showing us what the new Polish state looked like uh, as a result of World War I. And if you see here the percentages I put over here, you can see how many Jews were living in, in each section. The 1% more or less in Western Poland, they were formerly part of the Imperial of Germany. They had received emancipation, by the way, uh, in, 18, uh, in the 1870s uh, by Bismarck. So they were had that emancipation, had equal rights as citizens. The same thing in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the South. When you look in Galicia, about 25% of Polish Jews live in Galicia. Krakow being the Western capital of Galicia. And if you look down and you find Lvov, Lvov would be the Eastern capital. Most of those Jews also had received emancipation under the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, in the 19th century. And most of the Jews of Poland lived in what we call a uh, Congress Poland. Now, Poland is a, is, a, is a country that was formed after World War I as a result of the Versailles Treaty. Only about 69, 70% of the people living in Poland were ethnic Poles. A full 30% were minorities. And this posed a particular problem uh, for the Poles. Uh, the Jews were not the biggest minority. You see over here the Ukrainians. 15%, uh, they were mostly in the eastern part uh, of the new Polish state. Uh, Belarusians also in the eastern part, Germans in the western part. The difference between all the different minorities and the Jewish minority in Poland was that Jews literally were spread all over Poland. And I wanna make this clear that essentially, uh, I don't know how many of you originally are from Poland, how many of you have visited in Poland, or have children or grandchildren have gone on trips to Poland. It's estimated before World War II, there were 7,000 Jewish communities that existed throughout Poland. That's the largest. It was the largest Jewish community in Europe uh, before World War II. I'm gonna go back to the screen. And a little bit about uh, the Jewish demography, because this is important to understand the big picture. We're talking about the Jews uh, in Europe in general, but specifically in Poland. And I've split this up into the Eastern European countries, Western and Central Europe. And if you take a look at the, the numbers here, 3.2 was close to 3.5 million. This is 1933. About three and a half million Jews living in Poland, about 10% of the population, the general population are Jews. Uh, within the Soviet Union, which is a very large country, again, a large Jewish population, percentage-wise, not as many, but you take Romania and Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, large Jewish populations. Just for a moment, look down where it says Germany. Germany was the largest Jewish population in Central and Western Europe before World War II. But look how many Jews were living there. How many Jews were living there? About a half a million, less than 1%. Less than 1% of, of the uh, community in Germany were Jews. Now, when we think about this, and again, we're talking, this whole series deals with the history of the Holocaust. Most Germans never saw a Jewish person in their entire lives. Physically, they never saw them. Germany was a country with 65 million people. About a third of that Jewish community was living in Berlin, the major capital of, uh, of Germany, city of five, six million people then. Another third were living in other large German cities and the last in outlying areas, but most Germans never came in contact with Jews. And this is where the Holocaust, keep this in mind as you're going through this entire series unfolds in a country which had a relatively small Jewish population. You go back to the 
actual some more information. The world Jewish population. Look at these numbers over here. The world Jewish population. Before World War II, before World War II, we're talking about 16 and a half million Jews are living throughout the world. About 10 million are in Europe. And I have to tell, I tell stories. So just go with the flow. Being at Hashem for so many years, we have groups that come from all over the world. And I always like to ask the question, the groups that come, where there are very small Jewish communities where they live, I'll give you an example of China. There are really no Jews living in China. There's a small Jewish community in Hong Kong, Shanghai, other places, Israeli community, mostly businessmen, but a very, very small, minuscule Jewish community there. When I ask the Chinese, how many Jews are living today throughout the world? They begin at 50 million, because anything less than that is small change. I mean, for them, they can't understand. Jews are being spoke about here, they're in the media and this and that. There must be at least 50 million. The fact that today there are less than 15 million, about 14 and a half million Jews living throughout the world today is an eye opener for them. But before World War II, the Jewish community was a relatively small community throughout the world, 16 and a half million Jews. And again, of this 10 million Jews concentrated in Eastern Europe. Going back to the presentation. And a little bit more about uh, Jewish numbers. Again, to get to wrap our minds around the size of the Jewish community, in the 1700s, 1800s, it's estimated that there were about a million Jews living throughout the world. You see where I took the information from? Sergio de la Pergola. He is the probably the world renowned Jewish demographic expert. There are no real numbers for the number of Jews living throughout the world in the 18th and 19th century. It's estimated about a million, but the 1900 it, censuses were taken. There's about 10 million Jews living throughout the world. 1939, it jumps to 16 and a half million. The Holocaust, of course, decimates a third of world Jewry. And look at the uh, today, the number today is about 14 and a half million. Now, I don't want to go into definitions uh, who is a Jew, what is a Jew, what does a Jew look like, but these are more or less the numbers that we know today uh, of, the, of the 14 and a half million Jews today in the state of Israel, about 6.7, 6.8 million Jews. It's the largest Jewish community in the world. Just on a personal, I came to Israel when I was 18 years old, 1969. You can do the math. And when I came to Israel in 1969, about 2.3 million Jews living here, very small Jewish community with the the younger brother, younger sister of the diaspora Jewry. Today, with 6.8 million Jews, this is the community that actually is the spearhead uh, uh, of the Jewish people. By the way, the project, we talk about birthright. Birthright would have been impossible to do in the 1980s, even the 1990s. That was a project that once Israel became the center and where the majority of Jews are living, became also a focal point uh, to send young Jewish men and women to get some kind of shot uh, of Jewishness, what Israel is all about, and that therefore that project became so important. Going back to the presentation, uh, this is important just to see where Jews are living today. This, uh, again, not totally updated, but you see the figures you see Australia there, I think it's a little bit higher. It says 113,000, I think it's a close to 120, 130,000, but uh, I think you know better than I do. But giving you more or less the size uh, of the Jewish populations between the United States and Israel, that's about 85% uh, of the Jewish world today. Let's go back to Poland now, because Poland is a very unique Jewish community in the interwar period. Jews were a urbanized population. Although the cities in Poland were not large cities as they were in Western Europe, uh, you're talking about a Jewish population in the major cities, anywhere between a third 
uh, and 35% of every person you saw on the street was Jewish. Uh, and this is fascinating. In the pre-war period, let me go back again to see you all. In the pre-war period, every third person you saw in Warsaw, in Lodz, Krakow, Częstochow, Lublin, Vilna, every third person you see on the street in, the, in these places was Jewish. I've been taking uh, a lot of groups to Poland. In the 1990s, I was teaching in Israeli high school and taking my Israeli students to Poland. And these are kids that were born and brought up in Israel. And we land in Warsaw and begin our eight day tour uh, in Warsaw. And one of the main streets, by the way, the Poles left in many of the streets, the names, the original names, even though Warsaw was totally destroyed uh, when the war was over, both the Jewish quarter and Warsaw in general, they kept the previous names. So you had Jerusalemska Street. You correct my Polish. It's not as good as my, my English in other languages, but Jerusalemska Street is a major thoroughfare in Warsaw today. And my Israeli students would say, what is Jerusalem Street doing in the middle of Warsaw? I live in Jerusalem. What's it doing there? It's literally a culture shock for Israeli kids growing up here as the majority to try and understand that a very large Jewish population is in, is in these areas. You go to Krakow, you see Isaac Street, Esther Street. You see the synagogue, some have been renovated, some haven't been renovated, but the presence, the Jewish presence was a very visible presence that again, with 7,000 Jewish communities there pre-war, you can put your finger on the map and find a Jewish presence in almost any nook and cranny throughout uh, Poland. Something else, which is important here. And what was the Jewish profession? What were the Jews doing in Poland? Because this made them also very, very different from the Polish population. You'll see here that most of the Poles, about 60% of them were, they were agricultural workers working on farms, working on the land. By the way, anyone that's been to Poland, many places are very, very flat, has a lot of water, very fertile. For the Jews, they were concentrated in two major areas, industry and commerce. About 80% of them were in industry and commerce. But what I want to impress, impress upon you, the Jewish industry in Poland in the interwar period, it was the textile industry. Jews were Schumachers, tailors, Schneiders, uh, furriers. That was the Jewish industry in the interwar period. They didn't have the major banks or any major industries, but that even, by the way, Lodge was called the Manchester uh, of the East in terms of its uh, textile industry. And the Jewish, very, very famous and very, very wealthy Poznanski. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to Lodz, uh, visited Lodz, but the Jewish cemetery there in Lodz, uh, it's fascinating to see the mausoleum dedicated to the Poznanski family. Believe me, the size of that area where he, family members are buried, uh, most people don't have homes that, that size, the size of his mausoleum uh, where his family members are buried in beautiful colored mosaic tiles. Uh, this is a person that uh, was one of a kind. Uh, very, very few uh, Jews had that uh, social uh, and economic status that Poznanski had. But the textile industry. And the Jews were workers in that industry. Commerce. We're talking about commerce. Now, what was the Jewish commerce in Poland in the interwar period? I'll put it very clearly. In Yiddish, they were called Luftmenschen, Luftmenschen, people of the air. They were schleppers. They were peddlers, taking their things from place to place in their buggy and trying to sell their wares, or they had shops in different cities and towns. That was Jewish commerce. In other words, what I want you to understand, Mark Twain, by the way, said the greatest lie of the 20th century is statistics. When you see what I just showed you, that 80% of Jews were in industry and commerce, 60% of the Poles are farmers, 
oh, the Jews have all the money, and the Poles are schleppers. Not exactly. Jewish community was very poor, impoverished. These were proletarian, these were people that were working in factories and eat out an existence not a lot above what the Poles and their economic situation was themselves. Let's go back to the actual presentation. And one second before I show you this, just a few words. I'm gonna show you a very short video. The video a, was done by Yivo. Yivo has its origins in Vilna. A, and they collected bits and pieces of film from the 1920s and 30s. And they put together into a longer film. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. I'm gonna show you just five or six minutes that I've edited out to get a feeling, who are these Jews? What were their professions? What did they look like in the small towns and villages? Now you have to understand that about 3 million Jews from the 1880s to 1924 left Eastern Europe, not just Poland, but the entire area of Eastern Europe. So the majority went to the, what we call the Golden Medina. No, it's not Australia, okay? The Golden Medina for Jews was not Australia. You guys were just too far away. The Golden Medina for most Jews was America, it was America. And that's where most of them went. And a lot of them kept up the connections they had with Jews, with the Heimstadt, with their families, their relatives. They came to visit the graves of their next of kin. So let's see this very short excerpt that I prepared for you about Jewish life in Poland. 1914. Nights of terror are upon Europe. This map that is held fast for over a century is about to be changed. Three and a half million Jews scattered in the towns and cities throughout these territories and living under antagonistic empires are hurtled into World War I. Jewish soldiers find themselves wearing the uniforms of opposing armies. There are Jews in the Russian army. There are Jews in the Austrian army. There are Jews in the German army. And there are Jews in the newly reformed Polish legions whose soldiers fight against Russia with an eye on liberating Poland. brings massive destruction and dislocation. Oi zu aller Dona schie. Ach lieber Gott, was hast du gemacht? Die Abschein Rachmon ist auf mir. There were literally thousands of orphans left as a result of the war. Families were broken up. A large part of the population was dependent upon soup kitchens. People came back after the war. If they had already something in the house, there was everything taken away. There was nothing. I am Henry Rubinlicht. I am born in Warsaw in 1897, the 13th of December. We grew up as Polish citizens. We got obligations. The victors redraw the map of Europe. The Polish Republic is signed into existence on paper. 
in 1990 December, they called me to the army. Pilsudski was the leader. He was a patriot. He fight for Poland. He was my commander. And this time, I was in love with a beautiful girl. This was my love. This is Pauline Rubinstein. She was old 16 years. I was older than she was. When I have to go to the front on the battlefield, she come to me to tell me goodbye. The sun set down. It was a red sky. And we took in the arms. We create a song for us for goodbye in Polish. Niech mój śpiew wśród nocnej ciszy zruszy serce twe. Ach ty biła moja luba, choć w objęcia me. border war breaks out between the Soviet Union and the Polish Republic, which fears that Russia will once again be a threat to its freedom. When Poland fight for her freedom, we was interested to fight together with the Polish for our freedom. But when the Polish army was surrounded by the Bolsheviks, then was rumors that the Jewish people are traitors. And so General Haller, he gave the orders the old Jewish from the battlefield to concentrate in one camp. This was Jablonek. We, we was uh, prisoners, uh, close to 10,000 soldiers. Me obus Jablonna, nadzieja strasznie plonna, na dwór rzucono nas jak śmieci wór, na dwór, na dwór. Officially, these soldiers were exonerated after a fight in the parliament. But Jews begin to realize that their enemies are more powerful than their friends. Jews enjoy the legal rights of all Polish citizens. They vote in national elections, elect members to the parliament. As a minority, they are given the right to elect their own local governing boards. But things are bad on both the Polish street and the Jewish street. The destruction caused by the war and the loss of Poland's traditional Russian markets create enormous poverty, particularly in the small towns, whose economic role has long been in decline. These Jews, lining up for visas, are among the last to emigrate freely. The doors to America virtually close in 1924 and other countries adopt the same closed-door policies. But it is here in the town, the shtetl, that we find the traditional centuries-old setting of Jewish life in Poland. Though not all shtetl Jews are pious, the religious conventions are generally accepted. This man is dressed in the traditional style of the Orthodox Jews, which derives in part from the fashions of medieval Polish nobility. Between the 1880s and the 1920s, a million and a half Jews emigrate from Eastern European towns like this to America. But that road is a two-way street. Those who leave the shtetl take it with them. It is their cultural baggage. Most leave relatives behind, with whom they correspond and occasionally return to visit. A few make home movies of their trips, like Gustav Eisner, who took this footage, complete with title cards, to show friends and relatives back home in New York City. For 
the people living in the small towns, being filmed is an extraordinary and memorable event. was done by a family who came either 1930 or 31 to visit their hometown. This is the son, he actually took the pictures. He was a lawyer by profession, wealthy and charitable people. The one who shakes hands is my father, he's the rabbi. On the left is the guest, Mrs. David Shapiro. Next to her is her aunt, the Alta Hiene, my sister, my mother, and the last, that's me. We are very few who survived that shtetl. My parents were also uh, killed by Hitler in Marshmoy. And the few that survived, we meet occasionally, we compare old memories. The shtetl was next a river. Okay, I stopped the film. I shortened it a little bit. It's a little bit longer, the piece I edited out. But to give you an idea of uh, the relationships, Jews that left, kept up their uh, connections with Jews that had stayed. Uh, the philanthropic side of the Jewish world, Jewish community has been and always been an important facet. People sending money, parcels uh, to their brethren in Poland. And at the end of the day, this gives us some kind of a picture of where they're living and how they're trying uh, to exist. To understand some of the relationships among the Jewish community in Poland, I'm gonna take you now on a different trip. And I'm gonna try and give an overview of different political parties that exist in Poland, which was very, very unique. There were Zionists, there were Bundists, Agudat Yisrael, the Orthodox, there were different parties through, all throughout different European countries. The Jewish community uh, had different parties that they belonged to identified with ideologically, religiously, and spoke for them sometimes, even had representation in parliaments on the Polish CM. And that's a way to get to know who these Jews were, how they affiliated, who they were. I'm gonna take three different areas. The Zionists, uh, the ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, Agudat Yisrael, and the Bund. Now that every Polish Jew belong to one of these political parties? Nicht, nein, niet. They didn't all belong to a political party, but about 80% did. Most Jews had some kind of political affiliation. They voted for these political parties for a, a election time to the Polish a, a parliament. They voted for them in internal kihila, Jewish kihila elections. They sent their children to their schools a lot of these political parties had their own schools and youth movements. So essentially belonging to a political party in Poland was very different today than voting for any political party you want to vote for in Australia or United States or any other place. You were committed to that political party, its agenda, its ideology, its Weltanschung, its outlook on life. And that's where you lived, sent your children to. And that's how you understood your existence. I'm gonna take you through now. I've created a sort of a graph here, which gives you uh, the different political parties. In the Zionist party, there were the general Zionists, the revisionists, the labor, Polizion, and the Mizrahi, of course, uh, the religious Zionists. Afterwards, we have the Orthodox, we have the Bund. We're a very, very small group of assimilationists. And I'm not gonna go through that with you, but I wanna use this, this picture over here to try and explain the different uh, political parties uh, within the Zionist movement. 
I'm gonna come back here for a second. How do we know how many Zionists there were in Poland? And I like to ask questions. I can't allow you all to open up your, your microphones because there'll be a cacophony of voices here for more than 200 people. But how do we know who is a Zionist in Poland? Ladies and gentlemen, very simple. You pay dues. <laughs> you wanna to belong to a community, you pay dues. You wanna to go to a certain show, you pay dues. To be part of the Zionist movement in this interwar period, you paid a half shekel, which was symbolic of what the Jews in the wilderness gave as contributions to build the Mishkan, to build the, the tabernacle. And we had about 350,000 half shekel contributions to the Zionist movement, meaning you're taking their families of probably about a million of the three and a half million, about 30% of the Jewish community in Poland can be identified as Zionists. Does that mean they all want to leave tomorrow? No, but they were willing to send their children to their institutions. But the Zionist movement in Poland was a very, very fractured uh, a, a political combination of different parties. The general Zionists, I put up the picture of Yitzhak Greenbaum, I'll go back to the picture. These are people that we would call them the middle class, bourgeoisie. These are people that had, that had uh, uh, stores, uh, they were in commerce, they were in industry. And they took that Herzlian view of Zionism that coming to the land of Israel, building a Jewish state. And just for a moment, I just wanna show you this over here is that little book, it's called The Jewish State, the Judenstadt, that Herzl writes in 1896, 1897 is the first Zionist Congress, and declares for everyone the goal of the Zionist movement to create a Jewish state, the Judenstaat, that's what it means in German, the Jewish state in the land of Israel. Now, I have, you have to understand that the Zionist movement was never a mass movement among Jews. If we take, as I mentioned, the 3 million Jews that left Eastern Europe between 1880 and 1924, only about 1% of them, 1% of them decided instead of going to the Golden Medina or other European countries, they went in a very different direction to the land of Israel. About 1% of them. This was a movement of the few, of the committed, the pioneers, those who are willing to change their lives, their lifestyle, and to create something from nothing. There wasn't a lot of agriculture, so the commerce and industry were almost non-existent in the Turkish area that controlled the land of Israel before World War I, then the British controlled that area, but still there wasn't a lot of commerce and industry. And that's the essence of the Zionist movement, to try and bring people to a country which was underdeveloped, but had the potential of becoming the center for world Jewry and a place of refuge. With anti-Semitism was rampant to try and get out of those countries and come to the land of Israel. After the British took over in 1920, uh, the League of Nations, the mandate, the British mandate, they gave the name Palestine. And there organized immigration and greater numbers of Jews began to come to the land of Israel under the British mandate. Now, if I go back to this, these pictures over here, you bear with me. That's the general Zionists. By the way, they created their own school system. They called their schools Talbut, which means culture. And you had about 40,000 Jews that sent their children to these private schools, by the way, it costed money. Most Jewish children of the six, 700,000 Jewish children, the majority, the overwhelming majority of them, 80% of them went to Polish schools, it was for free. But there were those parents that decided to send their children to these particular schools because the language of instruction in these schools of the general Zionists, the Talbot schools was Hebrew. Kids learned Hebrew, the kids of course, spoke Polish, but learning Hebrew would prepare them for their eventual uh, aliyah uh, to the land of Israel. Look over here 
the Borchov School founded by Paul Etzion, 1929. These are the labor Zionists. The labor Zionists try to take two particular ideas. The labor Zionists decide to take the idea of Zionism, and I have a very beat up copy of a book called The Zionist Idea. You can see it like this, it's much easier. Arthur Herzberg, that's my beat up copy of over close to 50, year old, 50 years old. But the Zionists had all kinds of different ideologies. And among the labor Zionists, they took socialism and Zionism and synthesized it into an idea that to come to the land of Israel, we have to also create this new Jew, a new Jew. What was this new Jew? A person that worked the land. People that know the, uh, some of the names, Aleph David Gordon, A.D. Gordon, and others that came on this second and third wave of immigration in the 1920s, uh, right before and right after World War, World War I. And they wanted to work the land. Now, these pioneers built the first kibbutz, 1909, in a place called Umjunya. That's the Arabic name for the name, the kibbutz called the Ganya on the west and southern shore of the Sea of Galilee, 14 pioneers, 13 men and one woman. I always ask myself what the hell is going on there, but let's not go there. And these pioneers decided that by the work of their own hands, they would bring the land back to life. And that's what they did. Today in Israel, there are about 250 kibbutzim. There are also a very small number of religious Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox kibbutzim that exist in this country. But they were the avangal. They were the people that were going to turn this land into a paradise. Let's go back to the, uh, the pictures. On the other side, Zev Vladimir Jabotinsky. He's the founder of what we call revisionist Zionism. He was a person very flamboyant. His Hebrew, he actually was writing a, a articles and books in Hebrew. To read his books in Hebrew, you have to literally break uh, your teeth. He had to invent words that didn't exist. But he was also very active, served in the British Army, in the Jewish battalions in World War, World War I, and served here uh, with the British forces uh, that occupied and liberated and captured this area of the Middle East and brought it under British control in 1917 and 1918. Now, Jabotinsky didn't believe in the socialism, didn't talk to him. He wanted to create a Jewish state as soon as possible, a Jewish army, a Jewish state, built upon the Herzlian vision of Zionism. By the way, they had their own youth group. The youth group was Beital. The head of Beitar in the interwar period was none other, none other than Menachem Begin, who was the head of Beitar in Poland in the interwar period. These were the figures that these ideologies were in conflict with each other. A little story. I know we haven't got too much time, but a little story. Ben Gurion, who came here on the second wave of immigration, 1902, uh, socialistic Zionism and socialism believed in these ideals. Him and Jabotinsky were loggerheads, literally, to the point where Jabotinsky, in 1940, he left Poland, went to the United States to do fundraising for his Zionist, uh, revisionist Zionist organization, and he passed away in the United States. He stipulated, before he passed away, that his bones be reinterred in the land of Israel, whenever that would be. By the way, Ben-Gurion is the first prime minister of the state of Israel, 1949. And Ben-Gurion didn't even want his bones in this country. He said, leave them there. It wasn't until 1961 and 62 when uh, uh, Moshe Sharet became prime minister where the bones of Jabotinsky, his wife, Johanna, were reinterred on Har Heltzer. This is how deep these ideologies went, just to understand what was going on in Poland in this interwar period. 
And I want to get to the, the last one over here. This is Rabbi Yitzhak Nissenbaum, one of the leaders of the Mizrahi movement of religious Zionists in Poland. Uh, by the way, Mizrahi is just an acronym. It means in Hebrew, Merkaz Uchani, a spiritual center. It's an acronym. And the leader, the founder of uh, the Mizrahi movement was Rabbi Rhinus in Lida, 1903. Uh, it's in the area of Lithuania. And these are groups of Orthodox Jews that took religion and Zionism. Religion and Zionism. Now it's a take, there are 613 precepts. Rabbi Rhinus and other leaders of this Mizrahi movement said we also have a mitzvah to create a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Now, sorry to tell you, I know the rabbi figure is on this conversation. I don't want to argue with any rabbis here. I have to be careful. But there is no mitzvah to create a Jewish state in the land of Israel. To come and live here, to die here, to learn here. Yes, but there is no Jewish specific precept mitzvah to create a Jewish state. They invented that. It was innovative and, and, and not all the Orthodox Jews accepted this, but many did. Another little story. In the 1903 Zionist Congress of Uganda, interesting enough, it was the Mizrahi movement under Rav Linus that gave their support to Herzl's vision to create a temporary refuge in Uganda. Most of the other Zionists from Eastern Europe were against it. They supported it. Rabbi Rhinus has a book he wrote in 1903 called Or Chadash Al Tzion, New Light on Zion. And in his book, he dedicates it to the luminary of that generation, Theodor Herzl. That's the person he dedicates his book to. Now, Herzl had a long beard. He was very tall, very impressive. But ladies and gentlemen, he was a very, very assimilated Jew. He didn't even circumcise his own son. But these Jews saw him as bringing Jews back to Judaism, back to the land of Israel. That's how the Mizrahi, Rav Linus, and Rav Nissenbaum, and others uh, saw the Zionist movement. And they created this synthesis between religion and Zionism. There was one more little piece here. There was also a very small group of young Orthodox religious Jewish pioneers that took religion, socialism, and Zionism and connected it all together. And they came here and created religious kibbutzim, an unbelievable phenomenon, religious kibbutzim. There's about 15 of these kibbutzim uh, uh, throughout the country uh, today. Now, I'm gonna take you on to the next group of, uh, uh, of Jews. What I wanna summarize with the Zionists is that nobody talked to anybody. The labor didn't like the right-wing Zionists, the revisionists. The general Zionists were just this middle of the road people. The Orthodox, well, who likes them? There was no unity between all of these different Zionist groups. The only thing they agreed upon was two things, to make Aliyah and to create a Jewish viable settlement slash state in the land of Israel. Everything else they disagreed. What about the ultra-Orthodox Jews? First of all, how many ultra-Orthodox Jews? This is Rabbi Abraham Mordechai Alter, uh, the Ger Rebbe. Uh, by the way, there were large, the Ger Hasidim were part of the largest uh, group of Hasidim uh, in interwar Poland, about a quarter of a million identified uh, with the Ger Rebbe. But there were other dynasties, Bells, Vizhnitz, Lubavitch was more uh, to the east. Uh, not all of them joined Agudat Yisrael, but the Ger Rebbe, he was very uh, mobile. He went different places, visited different communities. And they decided they needed their own political organization to protect their own interests, which the main interest they, uh, the Orthodox had were their, their schools. By the way, they had the largest private school system, about 140,000 Jewish men and women went to their institutions, to the Yeshivot, to the Besyakov institutions. 
And this is something they created. Now, their language of instruction in all these institutions was Yiddish. Of course, they also learned in New Polish, but it was Yiddish. And that's in, uh, uh, when I compare what's going on in the Zionist world, where most of their schools, language of instruction was in Hebrew. Again, the ideologies here. And for these ultra-Orthodox, they said something very, very simple. Jews have been living in Poland for 600 years, since the 14th, 15th century. Why should we leave? They have institutions, they have yeshivot, Jews are living in different cities and towns. There's no reason to pack up and leave. Anti-Semitism, that's existed for generations. We're not gonna solve that. But they accuse the Zionists because of their idea to take Jews out of Poland, bring them to the land of Israel of inflating and inflaming anti-Semitism. Now, Agudat Yisrael was more than willing to support every Polish government, as anti-Semitic as they were, on one condition. They give them autonomy within their school system, which they did. After Piłsudski died, and the, there was an era of these colonels that were, that were ruling Poland, and it became more anti-Semitic. There was a law against Shechita, and the situation became less viable. And at that point, many wanted to leave Poland, but there was really no way to go. There was really no way to go. Let's go to the last group that I'd like to show you. And the last group are the Bund. You see Victor Altel, he's one of the leaders of the Bund in, in, into a Poland, the May Day Prayer in Bialystok. And a few words about the Bund. Now in Australia, you probably know a, a more than most Jewish communities because there were a different branches that actually tried to continue uh, this ideology and these thoughts uh, when they came to Australia in the 1950s. The Bund was a very small organization. How many people in Poland of all the Jews, of a third more or less identified with Zionists, or another third identified with the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox community, as I'll call them, about 10% identified with the Bund. A very small central organization. Now, think about this. The ultra-Orthodox were anti-Zionists. And they are, of course, had nothing to do with secular Jews, uh, the anti-socialists. The Bund, they saw themselves poles of the Jewish faith. They were socialists, and they wanted to fight for equal rights to Jews in Poland. By the way, they had their own schools. They call them centos. The language of instruction was Yiddish, which they saw as the language of the Jewish masses. At the end of the day, the Bund never had representation in the Polish parliament, as did the Orthodox and the Zionist parties. And at the end of the day, when push came to shove, they had no intention at all of leaving Poland. At the end of the day, of course, when the war was over, eh, there were very, very few survivors. And their idea of trying to remain in Poland, become Polish Jewish citizens, really wasn't viable. Now, I'm coming to the end here. Eh, I'm always very sensitive to your time as well. And I'm going to skip over this. And I want to summarize here. Something about the... Jewish community in general. By 1939, it's estimated from different sources, about a third of the entire Polish Jewry, they were living off welfare from different organizations. They simply were very impoverished. A, we know at the Avian Conference in 1938, the doors to Jewish immigration were more or less closed to countries a, inside and of course outside of Europe. The number of Jews that left Poland and had certificates during the British mandate of Palestine, a, almost 140,000 Jews. They received most of the certificates. There were Jews in Germany also received certificates, but mostly it was the Jews in Poland. They received these, and mostly they were young people. These are the pioneers, members of youth movements that managed to get out and leave Poland before the outbreak of World War II. You have almost 19,000 
young men and women that are working in different farms that are connected to different youth movements ideologically, waiting on their suitcases to leave to get out of Poland to come to, to Palestine. May 1939, the British authorities with the white paper close more or less the door to immigration. At the eve of World War II, Jews couldn't get out of Poland and come to Palestine. The British were allowing 75,000 immigrants only for the years, for the next five years, 15,000 would come in every year and that closed down totally once the war broke out. One of the major problems of the Jewish community was there was no unified front. The Bund didn't like the Orthodox. The Orthodox didn't like the Bund. The Bund didn't like the Zionists. The Zionists didn't like the Bund. Nobody really liked anybody in the Jewish community. I gave here on this slide over here, see there's one date and I wanted to at least point this out. There was one ray of light, March 1935, in a place called Pshittik. There was a pogrom there. Four or five Jews were murdered. All of the different Jewish political parties came together for a strike. And by the way, Poland closed down for one day. Literally, Poland closed down. If they came together, they had some kind of, some kind of strength. It lasted for a day, and then everyone went to whatever they were doing. This serious the sense of hopelessness and despair. And this Jewish teenager, the quote that I've given you, if someone asked me to describe the period in which I'm living, I would reply, a generation without hope. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's estimated that close to 100,000 young Jewish men and women were waiting to leave Poland to come to the land of Israel, belong to one of the Zionist movements, the war broke out, they were stuck there. Where do you go? What do you do? This lesson is an introduction to a whole array of other lessons you're going to be hearing that deal with specifically with the Holocaust. But I want you to understand that these young men and women that found themselves in Poland, not because they wanted to, but because of the situation, they became the avant-garde of the underground, of clandestine Jewish education and activities in different ghettos in places throughout Poland. But something else I want you to understand, the ideological differences didn't cease to exist on the 1st of September, 1939, when the Germans invaded Poland. They still didn't talk to each other. Now you could have a Jewish family like Tevya, that's where we began the whole conversation, where Parents may have been Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox. You had one son a Zionist, one a revisionist, someone a Bundist, maybe someone a communist, which was a forbidden party in Poland in the interwar period. And maybe someone that was a Bundist. In one Jewish family, you could have these different variations. That's what Polish Jewry looked like on the eve of World War II. But they couldn't get their act together. In March, 1943, in the Warsaw Ghetto, on the eve of the Warsaw Ghetto revolt. Only about a month before the revolt did all of the different political parties, the Zionist parties to the right, to the left, also the ultra-Orthodox and the Bund, they actually all came together under unified command and on, under Mordechai Heinelewicz. It took almost three years of war deportations, decimation, starvation, but they did come together. And it was a unified fight, which erupted on the 19th of April, 1943. Let me stop here. Uh, this is the time that I was allotted. I wanted to keep to the time framework. If, again, if there are any questions now, I'm going to pass uh, on to Lori. If there are any questions, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. It's only one o'clock in the afternoon here in Israel, a little bit later where you are, but I'm more than willing to hear any questions, reflections, uh, requests you may have. I love to beam myself up and beam myself down uh, to visit you in Australia. Uh, with the graciousness of the Gandel Philanthropy, I may have one last trip next May during the first Holocaust Memorial Week, which will take place. It's a groundbreaking, a memorial week, the first time in Australia. 
which is being also spearheaded by the IRA, uh, which Australia became a part of uh, last year. So I'm here, questions, requests, thoughts, feelings, just don't throw anything at me. Okay. Yes. Um, it looks like we do have some questions in the chat box. Uh, so let me ask you this question from Harry Schwartz. What would have happened to the Jewish community if there was no Holocaust? I guess we were. <laughs> and who asked the question? Harry Schwartz. Harry. Yeah. Okay. Harry, those are questions you never ask an historian. What <laughs> if? Uh, it's an interesting thought. What would have happened? I think that the community would have continued to grow. A, but what was happening in the late 1930s was a perfect storm. It wasn't just the Nazism in Germany. It were other European countries that were becoming more and more fascist, Romania, Hungary, Italy. So there was this eruption of a nationalism, extreme nationalism, uh, and anti-Semitism that if the war didn't break out and the war is incumbent upon the Holocaust as an outcome of that war, uh, the community would have probably continued to grow. It was still impoverished. Maybe the American Jewish community would have become more involved. The American Jewish community, by the way, you have to understand the 1920s and 30s was a very, very weak community in terms of its cohesiveness. And there was anti-Semitism in America. Ladies and gentlemen, my last name is K. That's not my real name. It was Kaminsky. And it was my father's brother, my uncle, who in the 1930s, he was a, one of these whiz kids, was offered a professorship at MIT in Boston. His name was Joseph Kaminsky. And they said to him, we'll give you the professorship, but not with that name. And he was the oldest of the three brothers. Somehow he liked the name Kay, I don't know why. By the way, Danny Kay also was a former Kaminsky, but we're not connected. And he chose the name Kay. So maybe the Jewish community would have become more active. We don't know. History is fascinating. And there, I call them consecutive circles. One closes, another one opens up, closes, it opens up. And it's difficult to answer a question like that, where the Jewish community in Poland would have gone. Another question. Well, so it seems like, first of all, a lot of very, um, a lot of thank yous. Um, and wonderful sessions. So I wanted to pass that along. Um, but also it seems we have sort of another what if question that a few people, more than one person raised and not what if, but they're, you're talking about how the Jewish communities were um, not united. And they wanna know, it seems like, it, it, do you think had the Jewish community been able to unite itself when everything was taking place at the beginning of the war, could things have been different? Uh, again, re just repeat the last part of it because I was watching all well, could, ah, Okay, could things, could things have been different in your expert opinion had the Jews been able to unite better? Would the outcome okay. have possibly been a little Okay, uh, John Candel is sitting with us here, okay? And out of respect and admiration, Jewish unity is a figment of our imagination. Okay, uh, we only wish it did exist. Uh, let me tell you another little story. For many years, Yad Vashem has been in contact with two organizations in the United States, the ADL, anti defamation League, and the Shoah Foundation. We have a donor, uh, Yossi Hollandale uh, in California, that wanted to create what you're just creating now in Victoria, a curriculum for public school, 10 lessons called Echoes and Reflections. John, you're aware of this because we've been using it in the Australian courses in the past. And the donor came to three different organizations, the ADL Yad Vashem and the Shoah Foundation and said, I'll give you a certain amount of money to create this curriculum. 
The condition is you have to work together. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the modern miracles of the <laughs> 21st century was that these three organizations with totally different agendas actually worked together from 2005 that began the project. It's already 15 years old, probably close to 50,000 American high school teachers have received training in the Secular Zone Reflections Program. But Jewish unity is something that uh, we'd love to have. Uh, by the way, I have to tell you, when I personally go to Australia, sometimes I feel like uh, I'm making a shidduch between this organization and that organization. We talk to everybody, but not all of you talk to each other throughout different organizations in Australia. Uh, so I feel like some kind of a uh, shadchan where I'm trying to facilitate a, a different organizations talking to each other. And as John was saying before, cooperating. Cooperating is a very elusive uh, byword in, in the Jewish community. Hopefully, uh, as time goes on, the need for unity, and certainly in interwar Polish Jewry, if there was a few more ounces of unity, it may have looked a little bit different. It may have looked a little bit different. Yes. Okay, so uh, we have time for one last question oh, yes. here. Okay. Is that okay? Okay, one last question. Oh, yes. um, was the apparent heated political divide in the interwar Polish Jewish community repeated in other European countries or America, or was it a unique, a uniquely Polish experience? Excellent question. I don't know who asked it, but <laughs> he gets a hug. He gets a Yad Vashem hug uh, and a Fryim hug. Uh, interesting enough, this proliferation and the different ideologies, it was unique to Polish Jewry in the interwar period. There was no other community that had this proliferation, these different parties that were connected and not connected. They spoke Yiddish, they spoke Hebrew, they all spoke Polish. There was a Zionist movement in Germany, there were other. The Bund was more of an Eastern European phenomena. It was forbidden in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union after the communist takeover, uh, but it was. In other Eastern European communities, you usually didn't see it in Western, you know, Western Jewry uh, in those communities, but you had bits and pieces of the Polish phenomena in other countries, but not like you had in Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, the Polish Jews were and continue to be very unique. So any of you that are from Polish extraction, I love you all, okay? Uh, a very, very, unique and special community. That doesn't mean I like the Hungarian Jews also, okay? But the Polish Jews, very, very unique. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ephraim, for that okay. formative and um, fascinating lecture. And we appreciate having you here today. Um, I just wanna give a few reminders to everybody. Please keep in mind, uh, Watch your emails on Tuesday so you can get the email about re-registering for Thursday's lecture. Um, and that's it. Thank you all for coming. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank, Thank you, you all very time. much for coming. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.